So we are just about back on time. Um, I've actually been asked to give no introduction to the next person, so my job is actually really easy, other than say, Adam Chatley, who's going to talk about leading commercial spa to profitability. Here we go. training. <laughs> so the reason I did that, I've not gone insane, um, we're often so busy getting on with the job as managers, cutting through that undergrowth, getting on with the day-to-day -day, that we don't even realise we're in the wrong forest. That's a quote from a book by Stephen Covey called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Anyone read it? Yeah. Excellent. So hopefully that was familiar to you. And the reason I've shared that with you in a Sorry about that for vegans out there. Um, in, a, in, a, in a way that I thought would hopefully resonate with you is because it's the, the lasting impression that I get of the difference between a leader and a manager. Okay, a manager is just going to do the tasks that they're given. A leader is going to get up higher than the business, take that 30,000 foot view on their metaphorical ladder, and they will see whether the business is going in the right direction and adjust course if necessary. Now... It's not lost on me the irony of the fact that I'm following JP, who's an expert in leadership, uh, Trent, Peter, all fantastic speakers and leaders. So I'm going to talk about leadership of your business rather than leadership of yourself. So that was a bit of fun. Hopefully you thought so. I did. Um, but now we need to get on to the important stuff. So let's talk about me. Um, I, you might be wondering why I'm up here talking to you about leadership when most of you probably think, why is he up there? He's that spa software guy who comes in and puts software in and something to do with gum nuts or something like that. Well, I don't really do that anymore. I've not done that for a few years. I still do that with a couple of clients who uh, I've worked with for a long time. But nowadays, I work a lot more with individual businesses. I tend to work with spas in the UK as a consultant and salons in the US as a salon business coach. But everything I've always done, both with the software and everything I do now, has all beca come because at my heart, I'm an economist. I love business analysis, process management, all these kind of things. And that's why I've used software in the past, because I love numbers. Oh, well, that's symbols for. I love numbers. And I know that makes me sound like a giant. That's supposed to be the sign of a geek. That works out well. Um, I know that makes me sound like a big geek, but it's true because numbers don't lie. Numbers tell you an awful lot about your business. And hopefully some of you just watched the, the Google talk with Treatwell a minute ago. Um, the numbers can really tell you where your business is going, and that's where I want to sort of explore things with you today. I'm not only going to talk about numbers, so don't run out of the room just yet. But um, ultimately what I do is I help make businesses more successful. And what I wanted to share with you today was the things that I keep seeing coming up in the businesses that I work with, the small changes that you can make, hopefully, in your business, or certainly the things that you can go away and take that 30,000 foot view of in your business and see if there's a small change that you can make that can actually make a big difference. So I'm going to share with you four things today. Two of them are quite new. Two of them you absolutely will have heard before, but I'm hopefully going to try and get you on board with them and actually see if you're doing them in your business. So just to reiterate, like I said, I now work kind of across the spectrum. Uh, in my kind of day job, I work a lot with salons, independent salons, independent spas, much smaller businesses. But I also work all the way through to working with spas as well, obviously. Um, a lot of you know me from the UK Spa Association. As when I'm working with salons, I tend to coach the person who owns the salon because they tend to be that leader in their business, so it's easier to coach them and for them to do the work on themselves and to change the business that way. 
when I'm working with a spa, because it's a bigger business and there's not a single person usually in there that makes the difference, I tend to work as a consultant, so I go in there and I sort of help actually make the changes. Now, I'm quite lucky. I've worked with, personally, with 450 spas, actually worked in them, with them, 27 different countries over the last 22 years. I know it's hard to tell from my incredible young looks. And with salons, I've worked with thousands of them in just the last couple of years. Now, how have I done that? I've done it because I started a website called Salon Business Secrets. Because what I wanted to do is I wanted to take all these lessons that I'd learned working with these big five-star spas and hotels in these beautiful countries. And I wanted to bring some of those learnings and those lessons and teach them to the, the, the smaller guys, the independent guys, the ones that couldn't afford £1,000 a day consultants. So I decided to start this website, and I just put some articles out there. And people seemed to like it. But it was taking me a lot of time to do. So I thought, well, I'm quite good at talking. So I launched this podcast. So I launched the Beauty Business Podcast. It's just been uh, rated number one in Europe for the beauty industry. Thank you very much. Um, and that's another place where I just share a lot of information, a lot of insights, um, and things to hopefully help businesses see some differences and make changes for themselves. And you probably also recognize me from many a UK Spa Association video as well. They can't seem to get me off camera. So that's kind of me. So if we really have to, let's talk about you. Who wants to talk about you? Is everyone awake? There we go, Emma Jane's awake. So I want to talk, talk about you, your business, and how new clients find you. Now this was really handy, because anyone who's just here, Google gave you a wonderful presentation. Google's not still here, are they? Excellent, wonderful. So Google were telling you all about the different search terms that are happening. So I want to actually talk to you about a slightly different way of using Google. So we're all pretty familiar now with needing to be high up the rankings, you know, at the top of Google, on page one of Google, all these kind of things. And a common search, like they said, and it's almost as if they set this up for me, is something near me. You know, we've all got phones, they've all got location-based sensors in them, so Google knows where you are all the time. So more and more people are searching for something near me. So actually, let's change that since we're, where we are. Let's go for spa near Coventry. And if we do that search, it brings up this result here. You're all familiar with this, it's Google page. It comes up with Spa Beauty at the top, and this is one I did just a couple of days ago. Uh, so it's Spa Beauty at the top, Best Western Plus, and those sort of things. Everyone familiar with that concept of searching for your spa near you, yes? I'll take that as yes. But the problem is now, we've got this thing called voice search. And who knows what voice search is? Anyone? Yeah. OK, so you've got these things like HomePod. So if you're an Apple user, you'll be talking to Siri. If you are more of a, an Android or an Amazon user, you'll either have a smart speaker or something like that. You can talk to your phone. You can even talk to your smart TV. I even saw a smoke alarm in Curry's that you can talk to, and it has a speaker built in, and you can ask it questions of, of Google. But the problem with this coming in now is threefold. First of all, these virtual assistants, Siri, Alexa, and if you're the one person who still uses Microsoft, Cortana, they're kind of getting in on this act instead of Google. They want a bit of this search rankings, you know, juice, goodness. So they get in the way. And the other thing is, if you ask your devices to give you information, the, these assistants are only going to give you one or two spars. So no longer is it about just being on page one. You've got to be right at the top. And the other thing is, when people are using search assistants like this, they're not limited by how quick they can type. So they're searching for longer things. They're searching for more things. So they're searching for things like, for example, a spa near me with five-star reviews. Or what's a spa near Kettering, near a good restaurant? Now, it's terrible grammar, but someone might ask that. Find a spa near me with access to nice walks. Or find me a spa near Coventry with parking. And just to illustrate this, if I do that search to find me a spa, a far, spa near Coventry with parking, what happens is I get a similar page as before, but an entirely different order of the spas that are on there. So all I'm trying to say here is because of these new longer searches that are happening, because we can now talk to our devices, you need to be thinking about the external factors that affect why someone might come to your spa. So it's not just about the treatment range you have and um, sorry, the product range you have and the treatments that you do and the facilities you have, what else is around you as well? And the way you do this 
to optimize for these voice searches, which are getting more and more. I think they were at 40% of most of Google searches are now done via voice search. You need to remove conflicting information. So you've all got loads of profiles. You've got, a, a, you've got your website, you've got your Twitter profile, your Instagram profile, your Facebook profile, your Google page. And if you've got different information across those platforms, and the classic one here is your opening times. So if you've got even slightly different opening times across those platforms, that confuses these search assistants. And what they do is if they don't match and someone's done a search saying, tell me a spa near Coventry that's open now, and that they find conflicting information across those platforms, they just dump you out of the search and they ignore you because they don't know what to do with it. So you've got to make sure all your information across your platforms is consistent. So use the same keywords, use the same opening times, use the same address, word for word, otherwise you could be damaging people's ability to find you. And likewise, you've got to remain consistent. So like I said, use the same keywords and things like that. And finally, you've got to think laterally. Lateral, that's hard to say. Um, things, external factors that apply to your spa. What have you got nearby? These are the most common searches for local businesses with something nearby. So parks, shops and department stores, public transport, pools, Michelin-starred restaurants, good food, bedrooms, wilderness walks, horse riding, award-winning pubs, and gardens. So if you have access to those things nearby your spa, even if it's within a short bus ride or something, you know, put that information on there as well. So that's a new one. Now we'll go to a classic. I want to talk to you about how to get more bookings. Who'd like more bookings in their spa? Nobody. Amazing. Oh, a couple of people. There we go. Yeah, fair enough. So all I want you to do is ask. Nothing revolutionary. Just ask questions. Okay? Nice. I've been nicely set up by the guys earlier on talking about asking questions. But you just need to ask them. And there's two ways this applies to spas. And in fact, I've even got the quote up there. Um, the quality of your questions determine the quality of your life or your results, which is Anthony Robbins. So there's two ways that you can apply this in a spa. First of all is in the consultation. Okay? That's a big topic to talk about. We all do, the therapists all do consultations. Ask questions. What are people struggling with? What do they want help with? Why are they there? Okay? Not only can that mean that your therapists give a better treatment, but ultimately it also means when they're making things like product recommendations to help that client when they leave your spa, they've told you what their problem is. They've told you what they need help with. Okay? I will tell you now, in this country, our retail to treatment conversion ratio is appalling. It's about 8.4% on average. Which, if you think about that, and what that basically means is that means for every 100 pounds of treatments you're delivering, on average, spas in the UK are only selling eight pounds 40 worth of products. And if you think about how much a spa product is, let's say it's on average around 25 pounds, that means for every three 100 pound treatments you're delivering, you're only selling one product, which is terrible. I work with a lot of clients in the States, like I said, over there the average is 30%. I work with one client over there, and they don't pay their staff commission if they don't hit 50% retail to treatment conversion every month. And that's not because Americans are amazing at selling. They've suddenly got this gift of being able to sell things. They ask questions. They're more comfortable with asking questions and then making suggestions. That's all they're doing. But that's a big topic. That's the consultation, and we could go on forever about that. But the other, the other way, if I can get you to do one thing after you leave this presentation, okay? Everybody who comes into your spa has a treatment. Before they leave, ask them to rebook. I'm not saying you have to arm twist them or sell to them or convince them or do anything else. Just ask them. Now, the great thing about owning a software company for a while and working with a lot of software is I've got a lot of data on this. And I've actually run this experiment five times over the past 20 years. And the results are always the same. So I'll break it down for you for now. If you ask, if your therapist asks every single client who comes in, and I get that it's slightly different if you're sort of a destination hotel or something, but generally speaking, on average, for every 10 clients you ask, if you ask everyone, six of them will rebook. Two of them will cancel. Four of them will move their appointment, but keep it within a six to eight week period of time, so they'll still come back in again. And two will keep the appointment that they made when you asked them. However, if you don't ask every single client, only two of those 10 people will, will rebook. So I don't know about you, but for simply asking a question, four bookings versus two bookings kind of means you're doubling your rebookings rate. 
Okay? Who'd like twice as many rebookings? Yay, there we go. Okay, so just doubling your rebookings. If you're not measuring your rebookings, by the way, you really should be. You should be around about 40% rebookings. Okay, yes, it varies depending on exactly who you are, but if you're not hitting really good numbers on your rebookings, think about it. Ultimately, you'll run out of people because you can't just keep bringing in new people over and over again. You're going to run out of people in the country or able to get to you. So you've got to be monitoring your rebooking rates. And if you want to boost them, just ask every single person who would like to rebook. That's all you need to do. And if you find out different results, give me a call. I'll come and check them out for you. But they happen every single time whenever I test it. So now I want to talk to you about how to make more money without doing any extra work. Who would like more money without doing any extra work? There we go. You're warming up now. I like this. So now I'm going to talk to you about something that, funny enough, uh, Trent actually mentioned. Where's Trent? He was here a second ago. There he is. Uh, Trent mentioned earlier on. And I think we're sort of a little bit aligned with this. But I'm going to talk about price. Now, I'm sure you don't need to do any sort of form of math. I don't need to educate you in any way to know that if you charge a little bit more for everything that you do, you're going to make more money. Or certainly if you charge the right price for everything you do, you're going to make more money. But whether it's a small independent salon who kind of come up with their prices on their own or a big five-star hotel spa, I'm constantly amazed by the lack of thought and analysis that goes into coming up with pricing. Now, again, because I've been able to get access to these results, because I've had software for a long time, a couple of years ago, I looked at the price of a 60-minute body treatment over the last 15 years. And it's actually gone down in price by 8%. That's not like, you know, adjusted for inflation and stuff. That's actually physically gone down 8% in price on average. Now, I think that's a lot to do with discounting, which don't get me started on. I'll be like Abby and I'll go off on a rant on. But, you know, this is a fact. They've gone down in price. All this competition, all this discounting has affected things. And I come across the four flawed methods of pricing time and time and time again. And I'm going to run you through these. I normally ask people to tell me how they come up with their prices, but it's too big a room. I'm not going to do that. So there's usually four methods of pricing. And I want to just, when I go through these, just think if these may be possibly applied to how you came up with your spa pricing. First of all, you've got what it costs plus a bit. Okay? Now, that's basically cost-based pricing, which is a decent start because at least it means you're covering your costs, so that's something. But you need to make sure that you've included all the right costs in there in the first place. But does it mean that you're maximizing your revenue? Because usually what I find is people work out the cost and then they go, oh, I'll arbitrarily add 20% on or 50% on or something. And that's just across the board, across all their treatments. So they've not really thought about each individual treatment and how much they can charge for that. So the next one I usually get is what they charge down the road plus or minus, or what a nearby spa, or what the nearby spas tend to charge. And the weird thing is, is I tend to get as many arguments for why you should charge a bit more than the local spas or a little bit less for the local spas. It sort of evens out. I love all the arguments I get. That's basically competitor-based pricing. And that's the worst one of all because you have no idea if the spas down the road did any homework into their pricing at all. And if you've not even looked at your cost-based pricing, you could be selling treatments for less than they cost you to do. So it's a really dangerous one to play with is competitor-based pricing. Then another one I get is what we think people want to pay, which I like to call best guess pricing. Okay, that's based on pretty much nothing, just what we think people want to pay. Again, that's not going to get you. And these are all okay. These are going to get you money, but they're not going to maximize every single treatment that you do. And then finally, we get what we charged last year plus a bit, or what I like to call finger-in-the-air pricing. And this is good because at least it means you're raising your prices and you're conscious that you can change them, but it's still not going to get you the most amount of money. And we don't even have the excuse of, oh, we've done a 10,000 brochure run now and we can't change the prices because they're kind of in there. Because I don't know about you, you don't need to print 10,000 brochures anymore to get a decent price. And at the end of the day, people look for stuff online, so you don't really need the brochures anymore. So it's much easier to change your price. There's no excuse to do this. The only method of pricing that really works that's going to get you the most money for each treatment you deliver is called value-based pricing. Now, I don't have time to go into this whole thing just now, but I do have two podcast episodes on it. You can go and listen to them. Um, but basically, value-based pricing is essentially working out all of the values that your spa has over and above all of the other spas, all of the other options, not just spas, all of the other options that your clients have to go for their treatment to get the result. So it's not just about the treatment, to get the result that they're looking for for why they come to you. So you need to look at all the different values you offer, put a price on them, and then charge accordingly. And you need to do this for every single treatment you do. Okay? It's the only way to do it. 
And just to give you a little clue, so I've done this again time and time again. I've done this with, I'll tell you now, I did this with Virgin Active, and I've done this with tiny little independent spas. The numbers always roughly come out the same. So it's quiz time. How much do you think, and I do want you to shout out some numbers, how much do you think a 5% increase in prices affected profits? Hold on. Just to put that into context, I'm talking roughly 75 pence onto a file and polish, £1.50 onto a manicure, £2 onto a full body massage. So how much do you think that small 5% increase affected profits across the business? Give me some numbers. 50%. That would be nice. It's not 50%. 20%. 2%. 10%, 37%, okay, it's 28%. On average, 28% for a tiny increase. The reason being is if you can charge the right amount of money for your treatments, it's all profit. Your costs don't go up. Everything else doesn't change. It's just money on top, and it can be a tiny amount of money. So does that make sense, roughly? It's not like a detailed one, but does that make sense to people? Yeah? Okay. Final thing I want to go through with you, and I'm keeping this really quick, which will please everyone. Um, how to keep more clients. Who'd like to keep more of their clients coming back again? Yay. Communications. Okay. I want to talk to you about communications. Who uses email to communicate with their customers? I'm hopefully people are just not putting their hands up because they can't be bothered. I'm hoping everyone uses email to communicate with their clients. Who is familiar with this sort of number when it comes to open rates of emails? Who knows what, do you know what open rate of email means? Is everyone happy with that? Number of times, so if you send out a mass email to all your clients, you know, for a promotion or something like that, these are the sort of numbers that you're looking at on average. Now, I would say, if you're hitting 23% open rate, you're actually doing really well. Abby, what would you say? Pretty good. So that's probably high. I think, realistically, I mean, I'm certainly, I'm seeing more like 19% when it comes to email, 18, 19%. And a click-through rate of 3.3, again, that's an average, but I think that's high as well. I think more like two-ish is pretty good. So if you're getting 2% of people to open your emails, and you've got a database of 1,000 people, that means only 20 people are opening every 1,000 emails that you're selling out, sending out. This is this other option, it's called Messenger, which gives you an average open rate of 90% and an average click-through rate of 45%. Who's heard of Messenger? Who's used Messenger? Yeah, the thing that originally was part of Facebook and now it's independent. Okay, so whenever I put averages up like this, everyone sort of looks at me and goes, yeah, but they're averages and they're not for our industry and all that kind of thing. Well, I worked with a spa called Ringwood Hall. Is Ringwood Hall here? There they are. So I went and did some work with Ringwood Hall. The day after we started using Messenger and getting their members to connect with them and communicate with them on Messenger. The day after, they had someone who went onto the website, connected with the Messenger system, couldn't find what they were looking for, asked a couple of questions on Messenger, got the answer straight away. They booked a treatment worth £338 that they are absolutely adamant they wouldn't have booked if it hadn't been for that. And I've spoken to Helen, and Helen has given me loads of other examples, but I didn't want to bore you with them. But she thinks there's in the tens of thousands of pounds of treatments that they've been able to get by using Messenger, connected with an automated Messenger bot process, which is dead easy to, use, to do, to actually deliver these treatments to clients. And the reason is, is back to what Lopo said earlier on. People are looking for information outside of your opening hours. So they're doing it at 10 o'clock at night when they're relaxed after their day at work. And they're on your website, and they can't find the piece of information that they want. You know. They've maybe found the treatment, they've maybe found the price, but they just want to ask a couple of questions and they can't get through to anyone. You can preload your messenger system with a little simple kind of filter load of options to answer people's questions that will ultimately deliver them either straight back to your online booking page, pre-populated with the treatment they want to book, and it's doing it in the way that the clients want. So if there's any, is there anyone from the marketing departments in the room <coughs> of their businesses? Yeah? So they'll probably tell you that the winners at marketing over the next decade are going to be the ones that can deliver a hyper-personalized response. So it's no longer about personalized marketing. It's about hyper-personalization, literally tailoring it to the individual. So letting them communicate with you when they want to, letting them ask the questions that they need the answers to, and simply delivering those answers in a quick, easy way that they've already got on their phones. So this doesn't need them to download another piece of software because everyone's got Messenger on their phones. And in fact, if you connected with it here, 
did everyone scan the scan code thing when they came in? So all that communication, although it kind of went off the rails today because the timings went all off the place, that's that messenger system communicating with you, giving you those options, delivering you information, allowing you to communicate back as well. So just to give you an example that, we got, that I got from Ringwood, for all those who are still doubting me, they sent out, they, uh, what is it, you created, you had a new treatment brochure, didn't you? So you had a new treatment brochure, some new treatments in there. And they wanted to get that brochure out to their existing clients. So normally what would you do in that situation? You would send an email out saying, we've got a new brochure. Here it is. But what Ringwood did was they used something called permission-based marketing using Messenger. And instead of saying, here's our new brochure, have it. They sent a message out saying, we've got a, fan we've got a fantastic new brochure. We've got some new treatments. Would you like to know more? Two buttons on the bottom, yes, no. People who clicked yes were then given the brochure. People who clicked no, clicked no were just said, no problem. Let us know if there's anything you can do. So from that, they had an actual open rate. So this is not averages. This is actually from their system. Actual open rate of 96.89%. Brochure download rate of 35%. And on the day, 17 people phoned up and made a booking for those treatments. Who can say they've done that on email recently? No? A couple of you shaking your heads. So... I know that was a really quick talk. I wanted to be quick. I wanted to help get things back on track, but actually I didn't realize we were going to start on time. Actually, I've been pretty good. So all I wanted you to do there was just to give you four ways, and I'm not saying these are exhaustive at all, but I want to encourage you to go back to your businesses, kind of take a step back, you know, look at it with new eyes, take that kind of high-level view, get on your physical or metaphorical ladder, and just look at your businesses and see are there any things you can make small changes to that could potentially have big differences in your business. Things like how new clients find you. Take a look into voice search. Take a look into that. Don't just take my word for it. Do some Googling on it yourself. But if you add extra things to your website, people are searching for this stuff. I kind of wish when Google were here they went into this, but they didn't. How you can get more bookings. Okay? Ask. Please ask. Just tell your therapist to ask every, ther every person. Make it a bit fun, have a leaderboard, see how many people have got rebookings. Trust me, it's going to increase the number of people who come back by double. How you make more money? Okay, really look at your prices. I know, because again, I love numbers, about 70% of you are going to listen to it and go, oh, that was interesting, and you're not going to do anything about your prices. But I'm hoping the 30% of you that actually listen to me go back and go, maybe there's some of our prices, maybe not all of them. Maybe we'll dip our toe in the water and we'll change just a few of our prices based on what that Adam chap said. See if this works out. And then how to keep more clients. You know, email is great. Email is the new postal address. It's, our, it, it's now the new reliable thing that we need to take off people, yes. But it's not necessarily the best way to communicate pe with people on a daily basis if you want quick results. Because again, like Lopo was saying, how many 10% of bookings are made on the day? 20% within two days. Email's not going to cut it for that. We all get far too many emails. So if you can use a system that can literally show up on someone's phone and they have to physically do something with it to get rid of it, and they can read it quickly, give them a yes, no button on, would you like to make a booking? Yes. Take them straight to the booking page. Honestly, it's going to increase your bookings. That's all I've got for you. Thank you very much. Have you got any questions? I've got like two minutes for questions, if anyone's got any. No? Awesome.